Hello and welcome to the garden. It's been a while, it's been a couple of months now and the reason why is because I'm working on, on another book but the deadline is around early November so I've just been trying as hard as possible to get that sorted and if you want to find out about that book I actually have a mailing list now so you'll be given exclusive insights and information about the book which is coming out next spring in both the UK and the US, we're also doing a special US edition. So that's something better than Veg in One Bed. But I just really wanted to show you what has happened in the garden, what's happening, the, the good, the bad, the ugly, and just give you more of an insight with everything that's going on and just hopefully a nice tour so you can get a real sense of how this garden is working this year. One of the things you may have noticed in the introduction piece is the onion harvest and these onions, I grew them from sets. I started them off in the first week of March and I transplanted them around early April, I believe, and they've been doing really well. I found that the, the red variety here, this is known as Red Baron, what happened with these is a few of these bolted um, but in terms of the other varieties, they did really well and I'm, I'm really pleased with, with how they've turned out. We've always struggled with growing onions from seed, so the fact that we can grow them from sets now and pretty successfully is great. And it also means that I'm going to have copious amounts of French onion soup. So that's me sorted. Last year I made the mistake of mixing up the short-term and long-term brassicas in different beds and when it came to wanting to do a whole bed of potatoes or leeks it got a bit confusing because like the kale was still flowering in April and May time but I really wanted to get the potatoes in. So roughly I've mixed up the longer term brassicas in this bed and the short term brassicas here. Now these big ones are Brussels sprouts which you might think are kind of a long term brassica to have in your garden but these are definitely going to be out by February as well as these summer cabbages and, and everything that's grown in here. So this whole bed is going to be clear and a nice blank canvas early on in spring to then put in my first early potatoes. And you can see in the back we've got Jerusalem artichokes and they're doing really well. And something that's happened this year is we have had a bit more rain than last summer, but again, it's a bit drier than normal. So I would ideally like these to be a bit bigger, um, but we've got some rain on the way, so I'm not gonna bother watering them. Here are two beds which have very different vegetable types but a very similar story. So we've got the runner beans, dwarf beans, second sowing of dwarf beans and all of our squash. So all of our courgettes and pumpkins and butternut squash as well. Um, probably the hardest thing this year bar having a bit less rain than normal years but luckily a lot more than last year was in June we had this period of probably about three weeks of just really cool damp weather and we had just transplanted all of these plants in and also the runner beans because they were just getting too big for the pots and we weren't expecting that kind of cool weather and I was getting really worried with the potatoes because I was thinking oh no they're going to get blight um, but what's happened was they've now exploded with growth and I noticed that quite a few of them were looking a bit tired and I thought we might be losing a few and we just lost one with that three weeks because squash really thrive off warm weather and if you're just going to put them out and it's about 12, 13, 14 degrees celsius for about three weeks they're not going to do well but they managed to just hold on and we're already harvesting some courgettes which is great and the same with the runner beans they were just not looking well they started having a lot of rust, so we're having to pick off some of the leaves. And when you have small seedlings, that can get a bit worrying. And I can see at the bottom, there's still a little bit of rust left, but since the warmth has come, everything has just exploded and it's beginning to catch up. And as you can see, it's all beginning to flower. So yeah, it was a bit scary in June, but luckily these have managed to see through that cool damp weather and are now bringing us some harvests. One of the most common questions I've had this year is why don't I net or mesh the brassicas? And it's a very good question. And my answer is, I find it a bit ugly 
Um, and I think everyone's going to agree with that. But also in terms of putting some kind of mesh over it all the time is if you're using something like EnviroMesh, I found that sometimes birds can still get through and get stuck underneath and get caught up. And so, for example, with all of our soft fruit, we will net them, but we'll check every day to make sure there isn't a bird stuck. And only yesterday, I had to rescue a blackbird. When we're having more of a long-term vegetable like this, and we want to go away for one or two weeks, like I was in Shetland for a week, you don't want to have that thought of, of catching poor wild birds and getting caught inside. So what we do is we do understand and we always have the the problem of cabbage white butterflies and you might see them flying about but every two or three days I'll just have a quick look and have a look for any sign of of cabbage white caterpillars and so far yesterday I found about three or four and it's just keeping on top if you can see any eggs you just uh, squished them and I saw some other damage again in the back but because it was just for the lower leaves I concluded that it was slugs and again as I'm saying trying to prevent slugs they're coming from the long grass behind here to eat and and they are doing well but I'm just going to remove those lower leaves so it makes it less enticing. The most disappointing vegetable we've had this year has been the broad beans and I think that cool weather in June was partly to blame because they started getting rust and even though we were trying to pick off leaves they were just too established uh, unlike the runner beans because I find when seedlings are small when it warms up they have that extra bit more vigour which ends up saving them but when you have established plants which are kind of half the size they don't have as much vigor when it gets warm or much excitement, you know, that early growth when children have a growth spurt. These are more in their mid twenties or thirties. So the harvest, we have had some broad beans and there were still, there were still broad beans about, but the plants are just looking a bit tired. So what I'll do here is just harvest the last of the broad beans and just take all the plants out probably just cut them right down below to the root and I will then probably transplant something like some autumn or winter cabbages to try and maximize this space. Now you can see that the leeks from last year are going to seed, trying to save seeds. This is something I've really been trying to focus on a lot this year. And here we have perpetual spinach, which has obviously bolted. And it always amazes me how small the leaves are and just how much energy they put into creating the seeds. But again, I'm trying to save as many seeds as possible. And I'm not really too bothered about these cross pollinating. I just want to see what grows. And, and they're pretty huge and they add some structure. And before the wind came and blew some of them over, I thought it looked quite ornamental. Um, but yeah, these are, these are still a few weeks away from being harvested. They're still green, the seeds, but if anyone wants some perpetual spinach seeds, give me a ring. In this area, there's quite a lot going on. You can see we've just transplanted some beetroot seedlings. Now, what we had here, this is the leek seed bed down in the bottom. And we've got three beds of leeks this year instead of one. So we've got one bed here. This is where all of the kale and purple sprouting broccoli were because we take those out in kind of the end of May, it's a perfect time to then transplant the leeks. And then we've put in, because we just had so many leek seedlings, where we had the first and second early potatoes, we've put in a whole other bed of leeks. And then in one of the new beds as well. So we've got loads of leeks, and that's great because I love them, especially caramelized with a bit of butter. Now, this is, we've, we usually divide our beds in terms of crop rotation in, into the vegetable groups. And this here is roughly the, the root veg group. And so we've got carrots, we've got beetroot, and of course we've got these parsnips, which are doing amazing. And I had to spend quite a while thinning these out because I used the board method, which I learned from James Prigioni, who I think, found it out from Bill Mollison in terms of trying to improve germination and just worked so well that I had to thin out parsnips which took ages so I know next time using that method I don't need to plant nearly as close together and then we've got some fennel at the top which isn't doing too well but there are harvests out of it you might be thinking what is this stick doing here and it is meant to be here I promise it didn't fall from the skies 
What it's doing is it's marking a spot where we found a bumblebee nest in the ground on the path. And so now if we're pushing a wheelbarrow or something, we have to take the long route around just because it's so good to have a bumblebee nest so close to the vegetable garden. You know, they've got flowers right in front of their front door. But yeah, there's just a, a bumblebee coming out and because the worst thing I could think of is treading over it and we don't know how deep it is in the soil either. So we just got to section off this area to protect the bumblebees. I think the second most disappointing thing this year has been the Swiss chard and the perpetual spinach and they've bolted and I only have myself to blame because we had about three or four weeks of hardly any rain and I didn't water them and so they obviously bolted but the great thing is especially with Swiss chard and also the perpetual spinach is when they bolt you can still use the leaves they don't go bitter like lettuce you can still use the leaves perfectly fine and also you can sow another sowing of these in late July so that's what I'm going to do I've run out of seeds I'm going to get some more seeds today plant them up in modules and transplant them and they should be able to overwinter fine and we can get some nice harvest next spring as well but yeah, just a bit of a shame that I didn't keep up with the watering. But I will be honest, I'm not used to it in Wales. And the last two summers, I'm having to get used to it. This is the salad bed, which was previously home to a load of brassicas early on in spring. And we've got lettuce, which is flying and going to seed. And it's quite amazing. These flowers just remind me almost of dandelions. And they only seem to last a few hours before they shrivel up and turn orange. And we had spinach as well. Um, this, this really luscious growth here is Celtis. Um, which is very similar to lettuce and you can eat it just like lettuce but it's actually um, a, a delicacy I believe in China and and you can eat the stems so I'll just break this part off here so these stems here um, and I've grown these really close mainly for cut and come again um, but these stems here can be stir fried and we had them last night and they were absolutely delicious and I've also found that Celtis is a lot less likely to bolt in comparison to lettuce so if you haven't tried it I definitely recommend you give it a go quite often people ask if I'm growing any ornamentals and unless it's an edible ornamental like hostas or rose then I'm very unlikely to grow them. But there's one thing which I do grow, and that's sweet peas. And I just had a load of different varieties, planted them up, transplanted them. And we've been harvesting sweet peas for, for weeks now. And a lot of them are now beginning to go to seed. So that'll be great to really get some free sweet pea seeds because they cost a bomb. Now, I think I like sweet peas a lot as an ornamental probably because they're very similar to just a normal pea like this one here hence why I'm, I'm i'm growing it but honestly the fragrance is amazing if you go for a very fragrant sweet pea and you come up in an early evening in into the garden it just hits you this is now the top of the garden where we've built raised beds from 100 percent british recycled plastic and they're doing absolutely amazing they have a, a lifespan of potentially 100 years especially if you use stainless steel screws and there's been a lot going on this year this was the this was still kind of is the grow a gift 2019 that Liz Zorab created and there's a couple of things which I've changed for it I'm still obviously doing the grow a gift but I'm I've just sort of allocated other parts of the garden into it because these leeks <laughs> I overwintered them um, they were just I don't know I think I just needed to do an example of how to grow leeks from seed in a pot and they were just about this big and they overwintered in the solar tunnel and I thought you know let's just plant them um, and see what happens and it's amazing how nature works because they know they've had another winter and that's why they're now going to seed but we've got a whole nother bed of leeks here just transplanted as well as the two others so this little row of six leaks will be i'll make up for it i think so the solar tunnel is um well it's turning into its yearly jungle stage again um you might remember if you saw the patience is paramount video how the grapevine was just completely decimated by a late frost and um 
really pleased to announce that it's recovered really well as I as I said it would because it almost seems to happen every single year you know you'd look at it and you think there's no way that that's going to come back and if you compare how that looked then to how it looks now it's just absolutely amazing and uh, yeah we've got loads of clusters of grapes so that's really exciting um, the tomatoes are doing really well um, there's just been a couple of um, leaves which weren't looking too happy I don't know if it if it looks slightly like blight um, I just cut those off that was about a couple of weeks ago and there doesn't really seem to be any problems since I mean tomatoes always I find have a couple of bits of miscoloring especially in the lower leaves which is why with the stems I just like to clear the stems um, of all leaves up to the first set of fruit and that seems to minimize any kind of damage or, or risk of disease and I can see loads of tomatoes beginning to come through we've got about seven different varieties here and I just can't wait for them to turn red we had peas here these are for pea shoots and they then started producing amazing peas but you know they've seen better days uh, we've got a tobacco plant here because I bought a tobacco plant and I was just really curious to see how it grows and it has this really um, amazing white flowers I've got three rows of peppers and then finishing off with some squash here the end of July into early August is a funny kind of transition time because suddenly the focus seems to go a lot more on, on the harvesting side of things rather than the growing but for me everything is blurred uh, especially from kind of June onwards with with growing and harvesting all the way through to October because I'm trying to maximize as much as possible by using succession planting and so that means that in some areas I can get two maybe even up to three different crops from the same size and I don't think enough people are utilizing that or making the most of it and also another thing is I now don't take much notice with crop rotation I just make sure that the same thing doesn't go in the same place for more than two years and keeping the squash and runner beans in the same place because you can uh, year after year saves a lot of hassle um, so that's just kind of my feeling about that and that if you aren't doing succession planting use it because you know we wouldn't be able to have two extra beds of leeks those would just be plain and nothing growing in them until next year and I think that's really powerful and I also find that trying to grow different things every year is useful um, this year I tried growing spring onions and I grew loads and I probably ate about two or three because as a family we don't really use or eat spring onions and even just having them here we just put them in a couple of salads really so I know if I do want to grow spring onions um, to probably quarter what I'm currently growing um, so yeah it's really useful to see that dynamic but I finally just want to show you what's been happening in a separate garden here on our small holding so a very warm welcome to the second garden here now if you can see the wood store behind everything behind that is where the current original garden is and this is different because this has been partly funded by the RHS the Royal Horticulture Society here in the UK and it's in transition so you can see I'm putting the paths down I've got a massive pile of wood chip that I had delivered a couple of weeks ago and yeah so everything's gonna look really nice we're getting a kind of greenhouse in which I'll talk about a bit later on in in detail in another video we've got five IBC tanks for water storage so I can store 5,000 litres so just over a thousand gallons or so so that's really important but the main idea with this garden is to use experiments and to do trials so here we've got you wouldn't believe it we've got about 46 different varieties of dwarf French bean for a trial um, and I'm doing other things so chickpeas um, never grown them before thought I'd give them a go they're doing really well and um, growing potatoes using different methods but again this is very early stages and the main emphasis is going to be next year and I'm also doing some pot growing potatoes as, as an experiment so I hope this video has given you a bit of a flavor and a feel for what's happening in the garden at this time of year and all of the things going on and it's almost impossible to include everything because I just end up waffling for hours and I appreciate that you, you don't want to sit through that um, 
but hopefully it's given you a bit of an overview of, of the different parts that are happening, um, what's been working well and what hasn't been working quite so well. And I think one of the best things this year as well has been the potato harvest. It's just been amazing. We've got more potatoes to harvest as well. So I'm really pleased about that. And if you are interested in getting updates on my second book, then please do join that email newsletter. And I'm also really excited because Veg in One Bed has now been translated into French, Dutch and German. So that's really exciting. And the final thing I have to say is I hope you're having an absolutely amazing growing season and that everything is growing well and you're enjoying all of your harvest, all the fruits of your labour. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask or maybe just tell me what's been going well and what hasn't been going well for you this year so we could perhaps compare.